Are now going to listen to Mike Wright first, who is professor at uh, Imperial College School of Management. Uh, uh, so he will talk uh, about his experience, and, and uh, then uh, Heinrich Plegel will take the stand. Mike, please. Well, uh, thank you uh, for uh, that introduction, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm afraid the, the only two uh, Portuguese words I know are Jose Mourinho, and uh, <laughs> he, he, uh, he manages the wrong football team, or, or, or at least he does until he gets sacked tomorrow after the polling results. So um, I'm going to talk about academic entrepreneurship, so this is going to be a, a much more uh, uh, wide-ranging presentation. Um, and I was intrigued um, to hear that this is kind of the 30th anniversary uh, conference. Um, and I'm trying to cast my mind back 30 years ago uh, to when I first started the Center for Management Buyout Research there. Um, and my head of department th thought I was wasting my academic career on this, um, uh, which I've been doing for 30 years now. And um, in those days, the, the notion of kind of some kind of commercialization of research was a very strange thing, uh, if not heretical. So it just gives me a feel for how far we've, we've come uh, in those 30 years. And um, we hope we, we'll go even further in the next 30. So I'm going to talk about this uh, emerging landscape. Um, this landscape um, is, the, is the Col du Tour Malay in the Pyrenees, um, if you don't recognize it. And uh, modesty forbids me to tell you who that person is suffering. Um, so uh, some of my work has been on uh, spin-outs, and um, here's some of the work I've done, so I'll uh, rush out and buy it for Christmas. Um, uh, what we know is, uh, if we look at academic entrepreneurship through spin-offs over the last 20 years or so, uh, here's some perhaps names you may or may not recognize of very successful spin-offs from uh, various universities across the world. Um, so OK, there have been good examples of spin-offs. Um, but it seems to me um, that the university environment is, is changing very rapidly. And um, expectations uh, of what universities do, as I said, in 30 years, it's completely changed. And it seems to be changing. And um, as the, uh, the great philosopher and my mentor said, there's, there's nothing so stable as change. Uh, so we better get used to it. Um, uh, and what that means is that, um, as I look around, uh, new forms of academic entrepreneurship are emerging, uh, as well as the ones that we, we've been looking at. And therefore, the challenge is that how can um, not just universities, but government, technology transfer offices, corporations, develop uh, what they're doing to, to actually get the returns from uh, academic entrepreneurship? So it seems to me that... Uh, we're at quite a juncture to, to look at uh, some of these issues, which is what, what I want to do. So I want to take a stock of really where we are, which are the emerging trends, and then to start to think about uh, think what's happening, and then maybe to look forward um, uh, over the next decade or so. So if you think about where we, we are at with academic entrepreneurship, kind of the traditional perspective is, you know, why are we doing this? Well, primarily it's been to to generate financial returns. Um, universities and government perhaps seen this kind of dollar signs or euro signs in front of their eyes. Uh, and uh, that's been happening through spin-offs, as I said, but also licensing and patents, gener generating licenses, consultancy. Uh, and much of that has been through academic faculty and postdocs. And it's been facilitated through tech transfer officers and, and science parks. So I think that's where we've been developing over the last 20 years. If we actually look at the, the evidence that's um, emerging, um, notwithstanding those particular examples I mentioned, then it seems to me that it, we've got a very skewed picture of the success rate of academic entrepreneurship. 
licensing revenue is very much uh, skewed towards one or two very uh, blockbuster licenses. And if we look at the now thousands of spin-offs that have been created, very few actually grow uh, or achieve significant exits. You know, those that we do see are, are a small number against a very large number. Now, that may be not too unexpected, given we're looking at high-risk things, but in, in fact, uh, it's still quite small. And this links to issues to do with raising venture capital finance. It becomes very challenging for firms and universities. And it also links to issues to do with the, the right kind of expertise in technology transfer officers to be able to uh, identify and, and to promote uh, academic entrepreneurship through, through spin-offs. And a lot of challenges there. And what we also see is that this impact or the ability to have an impact differs depending on which kind of universities we're talking about. You know, all universities are not the same. Um, you know, in the same way as we've got um, top echelon football clubs, uh, to, to take one entirely at random, Manchester United, uh, you've then got the rest. Um, so, you know, you've got to the, what, what I might call mid-range, uh, more perhaps localised provincial universities. Uh, and if we look at the research and impact of spin-offs that's coming from them, we see quite a difference. This, this is a study that came out, it's based on the UK data, um, but actually showed that uh, the top echelon universities are really the ones that are going to generate value from spin-offs, whereas the rest, the mid-range ones, it's from a much more varied uh, impact through uh, research, teaching, consultancy, and so on. And the academic entrepreneurship activity through spin-offs is rather a limited uh, part of that. So we have to be a bit careful in trying to apply you know, the, the MIT approach, if you like, to, to all universities. It ain't going to work. Uh, and if we look at um, the creation of spin-offs, this is, again, UK data, but it illustrates a general pattern. Uh, what we see is, uh, I think the colours are just about clear, the top line is actually the number of spin-offs created per year in the UK by the top 25% universities. And, and then it just goes down the quartiles for the rest of them. So first of all, you can see that it's the top quartile that's generating most, but you can see this very strong downward trend over that period since 2000. Uh, and that's even taking into account the the financial crisis around 2008. Uh, so what we're seeing is a reassessment of spin-out activity and a flight from quantity, perhaps to quality, but also to licensing as an alternative. So this kind of pattern is changing uh, uh, over time. Um, and we can't just say, well, it's all about spin-offs by faculty because uh, uh, that's uh, not for everybody. I think what we're also seeing, if you look at the macro picture of facing universities, is competitive pressure and benchmarking of universities against each other, which is bringing pressure to, to, to be active in academic entrepreneurship. Okay, so you, you can't really just stand back and let it wash over you. Things are happening. What that was also bringing, and I'm not quite sure the picture in Portugal, but certainly in the UK and the US and many other countries, is increasing pressure to generate funds from private donors, from alumni. Uh, and what one is seeing is growing interest in funding uh, student entrepreneurs uh, and using funds to commercialize those kind of ventures. You can see some examples of of US universities. So we've seen this kind of shift in, in the way in which interest in academic entrepreneurship is occurring. Okay. What we've also seen, I think, is this shift from a traditional focus on what I call the research third mission approach. So in other words, commercialization based on research coming out of faculties. And we, you're going to be talking about that this afternoon. Uh, but that is developing beyond the kind of the formal IP, and I say beyond rather than instead of, uh, to, to more informal IP, particularly at the IT end of the spectrum, but you have the uh, 
possibilities for academic entrepreneurship that doesn't just involve formal patenting. And similarly, that's associated with this increase in the stakeholders, both internal and external to the university, to do with regional policy, uh, local industry, and so on. And I think what I detect is a changing emphasis or a balancing of emphasis, if you like, to a teaching and education third mission nexus. In other words, this is where the student entrepreneurship, the curricular developments are coming in, and what that introduces is a wider scope of, of academic entrepreneurship. So what, I, what I, that is leading us towards uh, is, this, is something like this, which I don't intend to go through this in, in any detail. It's just meant to be schematic to illustrate what's going on. I think it seems to me that we're get, seeing a more complex emerging landscape for academic entrepreneurship that's involving a whole new set of entrepreneurs. So I think this, does this work? Doesn't work. Or it does just about... So on the left there, you can see all sorts of different kinds of academic entrepreneurs. Um, so not just faculty, but students, alumni, support from a whole different set of agencies rather than just the TTO, including the business school, entrepreneurship centres and so on, and a whole different range of investors from government grants, but also through crowdfunding, business angels, and so on. And then within universities, I think we're seeing or well, we're going to see more the emergence of different sorts of incubators from what I call pre-incubators or pre-accelerator communities involved in teaching, garages, and so on, through to um, preparation of those very early stage ventures for proper um, incubators, accelerators, and science parts. So I'll come back to that. So you know, you've got this much more complex but more interesting opportunities, I think. So to think about why that's happening, again, I think it's because I, certainly um, in the UK, but I think also elsewhere, US and perhaps even here, is stakeholders, not just government, but local industry, local governments, are demanding a much wider contribution from universities that Im involves both social and economic benefits. Um, so rather than this kind of pure, simple monetary impact, then we're thinking of a wider scope. And that's really putting pressure on universities to adopt a more strategic approach. I think one has to think about the strategy of the university dependent on your research base. And I think it's introducing these multiple modes of commercialization. So what I would call direct versus indirect, or direct and indirect. So spin-offs, licensing, but also new sorts of incubators and accelerators to create very early stage ventures as well as entrepreneurship programs right across the university. I think that, that is also uh, impacting the, the nature of the emphasis because we need to think about the different possibilities of different departments within universities in different disciplines where the approach to academic entrepreneurship needs to be different, their approaches to it may be quite different. It may also differ between universities that are international or your top echelon versus the more local or mid-range universities, more fine-grained strategy. And what that also means is that regional support policies uh, also need to differ. And what we're also, uh, that implies is that different collaborations between universities, which um, used to be a very strange thing, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, it, is going to be something that's going to emerge. For example, um, the two examples here are the University of Nottingham, which is where I was for many years before I went to Imperial, um, and the University of Birmingham are actually collaborating together to promote not just science, but also academic entrepreneurship. And these are based, one in the West Midlands and one in the East Midlands of the, of the UK. So they're identifying complementarities and critical mass that, that actually can create new ways of thinking about academic entrepreneurship. I think this also means we're going to have to rethink the way in which we look at IP strategies uh, to do with the ownership of IP. Um, is this uh, to do with private benefits for the ac academics? Or what about the wider social benefits? Who actually owns that? Uh, but also, if we're going to 
have ownership to give an incentive, then we also need to have the support that goes along with it to realise the opportunities. There is some recent work uh, comparing the US and Sweden, which shows that uh, uh, in these two countries you've got very different regimes for ownership of IP. Right? In Sweden it's the professor's privilege, as we call it. Uh, professor's privilege to me always seems to be about professors having the privilege to work for nothing. Um, as you know, with salaries are not exactly wonderful. But it's the ownership of the IP by the professor in Sweden where it's not in, in the US. And what you tend to see is in Sweden you see more ventures created than in the US, but the quality in terms of wealth creation or growth uh, is no different. And what that suggests is that uh, it's not so much about the ownership, it's the support to actually help you to realise that. And maybe it also opens up questions about open source ownership because if we're thinking about the wider impact of universities, maybe uh, getting the intellectual property out there is maybe the, the appropriate way. And what that also has implications for is how we're actually going to measure and evaluate academic entrepreneurship. It may be easy to count the number of spin-offs uh, and the number of licenses and the revenue, but counting the number of startups by, uh, by students or by alumni uh, becomes more difficult. But yet, um, that is where we may be measured in the future. So, okay, that's the why for why it's happening. Uh, what does it involve? I think, as I said, that uh, this is involving direct and indirect academic entrepreneurship. So not just faculty spin-offs, but also by alumni, uh, startups and spin-offs, by students. Uh, but also uh, startups and spin-offs that are not just um, pure commercial, financially oriented, but actually have a social enterprise uh, development. Uh, and that, I think, is something that... Um, is starting to emanate from students. Uh, I have a lot of students on my MSc course, uh, an MBA course, that uh, if I compare with 10 years ago, MBA students always wanted to have a, a very commercial venture. Now much more, it's about a social venture. And that clearly has an impact of things coming out of universities. So I think we need to look at it in this wider perspective. Uh, we're also seeing a lot more spin-offs by graduates who go to work for a corporation and then spin off. So if you like, that's a very indirect form of academic spin off. But actually, if we look at the financial impact, economic impact, those are the ones from the data we've looked at are the ones that are going to grow more and have the biggest impact. So again, we, we need to be careful and take this broader view. Um, and again, this formal and informal IP comes in, particularly in the commercial and social ventures. Uh, the, the, uh, the guy on the, the bottom right there, you can see, uh, and you may have come across this, uh, this is the, uh, the million dollar homepage. Uh, this is a student at Nottingham who, uh, to pay for his student uh, fees and uh, time at uh, university, actually created his homepage and sold the pixels for a dollar each uh, and made a million dollars. Um, that's a lot of beer, even for an English student. Um, so, but you can see the kind of uh, uh, ventures that um, we're opening up. Um, so examples of some of the kind of things that are happening. Uh, in the US, Johns Hopkins University has this um, scheme where uh, the, the business school students have to take a discovery to market course, and they partner with the TTO to conduct market analysis, commercialization. So there's... Uh, there's that kind of, that's one example of ways to stimulate academic entrepreneurship. Uh, at Imperial, we have a thing called Create Lab, which is, uh, involves Imperial Innovations, which is the, uh, the spun out uh, TTO and now listed. Uh, and they provide support for students and postdocs and, and even faculty to, uh, as a, as a, if you like, a pre accelerator to, to create and um, move off ground zero, very early stage ideas. And you can see the numbers there that uh, are involved. So this is kind of beyond the hard IP that Imperial Innovations would be involved in, but it's the much more early stage ventures that um, are becoming much more an important part of uh, what they do. I think uh, what uh, this uh, new landscape 
has implications for is who is involved and who's doing it. And I think if you think about academics, then I think that has implications for the incentives for academics. Uh, I don't know it's like, again, in Portugal, but in the UK and US, although the, one was trying to say academics should be getting involved in this area, uh, there's very few incentives for doing it. Um, when I was at Nottingham, I sat on the, the technology transfer board, and uh, I can remember we, we had the academics in to, who were talking about the ventures they were doing it, and the, uh, uh, the bursa, the financial officer, said, uh, I can remember him saying one time, Oh, this is all very well, but if these guys make money, we're going to go after them. Um, and I thought, well, that's a wonderful way of incentivizing people. And, and they did actually take one guy to court for this. And so I think there's kind of, you know, these are, these are nutters, but the, 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 the kind of a very strange conflicting objectives. We want you to do it, but don't you dare make money. So, so there's a whole um, confusion and conflict in the way in which is incentivized and recognized. Very few um, universities recognize this for promotion or tenure. I think in the US, there's only 16 universities do that. Uh, in the UK, we have this five yearly research excellence framework, which very much focuses on your best publications in a five year period. Uh, only very recently has it started to introduce academic entrepreneurship. So we have to, to, if we are going to go down this track even further and broaden out academic entrepreneurship, then we need to get the incentives and the evaluations right. And thinking of the TTOs who are going to help to do this, again, we need to think about the backgrounds. Have we got the right mix of legal and entrepreneurial skills that, okay, we can sort out the IP ownership, but actually can we help formulate these ventures? And I think that creates a number of issues for TTOs from a resource point of view, but it also has implications for how the university interacts with the TTOs. And what that also implies is this kind of agency issue about how you actually manage a relationship between the academics, the TTOs, the universities, the students, and society. Uh, because, they're again, conflicting uh, approaches. You know, the TTO is the TTO working on behalf of the academic or the university, or both, and how do you resolve that? Students, where's the ownership of the IP for the students? What about the resources students may use to create their ventures? Where's the ownership of that, and how do you deal with that? And then from a wider societal point of view, then how do you reconcile the, the private benefits to the academics and maybe the university with wider social benefits? Uh, University of California at Berkeley uh, have started to recognize this and are trying to design socially responsible licensing programs that try to capture some of the benefits for society as a whole, but it raises more complex issues. Uh, and how then is, is this occurring? Well, I think, well, that, what this implies is that we need to think about how we design what I would call the entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, around academic entrepreneurship. What kind of pieces of the jigsaw, if you like, do we need to put in place to actually make this work? And that may differ between different kinds of universities and between different industry locations. So we need to think about how we put that together. We also need to think about developing new kinds of facilitators, not just the traditional TTO, but accelerator programs, you know, these four or six month programs to, where universities have links with these programs to actually take very early stage ventures to them. So for example, one of my MSc students um, uh, was involved in a startup called GateMe, uh, which is to do with uh, uh, tickets for getting into concert venues. Uh, he did this as part of his MSc project and then he got on the Seed Camp accelerator program to take it another stage for. So formalizing or developing more proactively uh, those relationships is one way forward, I think. At Imperial, we also have what we call Imperial Launchpad. What this is, is at the end of the MSc and at the end of the MBA, we have a, a, ven a venue, an event, where we invite accelerators, business angels to come in, and the students make presentations or discuss with them uh, and get uh, links and funding for them. So the ways in which we can see how you might develop this activity. 
I think also uh, we, we need to think about university governance at the university governance level. In other words, how do universities, boards, and councils uh, have the skills to develop this activity beyond making statements like we want to do it? Okay, the, the, very often there's a disconnect between what the universities say they want to do and their ability to do it. Uh, the chart on the right, which is uh, maybe a little bit difficult to see from uh, at a distance, but what this is based on is some work we did across Europe, which showed that um, many universities were saying, yes, we want to develop uh, academic entrepreneurship and spin-off activity, but the two big ellipses either side of the diagonal showed that many of them were either not putting in the resources or didn't have the competences to, to actually do it. Uh, so there's a big gap, I think, between the aim and the actual strategies to, to develop this. And I think that still needs work. And then the other dimension is in terms of academic mobility. So first of all is in terms of recruiting academics who are, are academic entrepreneurs, but also retaining them. Uh, I think some universities have to be careful that you'd Okay, you want a high-flying researcher, but many often high-flying researchers are also good academic entrepreneurs. And maybe you have to say, well, we will support you for the, your laboratory, but also we're going to support you for the academic entrepreneurship. Because these guys are very mobile, um, and if you perhaps don't pursue them, their interests with academic entrepreneurship, you're not going to retain them. I think it's also important is to retain alumni or entrepreneurial alumni within the region uh, rather than them disappearing to a metropolitan centre. Because I think without this is an important part of developing the local ecosystem to actually help these, these startups to develop. And, and the third point on there is whilst we see a lot of postdocs and PhDs um, saying they want to be entrepreneurs spinning off, many of them don't. And part of that is because we don't provide the enough support to enable them to do it. So they go and work for a corporation because it's easier. So if I can summarize that, summarize that landscape, what I think it suggests is that currently the why is we've got to provide a wider economic benefit plus this more social benefit of the university ecosystem. I think that is becoming clear on the agenda. What that means is that traditional TTO activities need to evolve, connecting better with the university, other parts of the university, perhaps the teaching part of the university, to actually facilitate more student and postdoc startups. I think entrepreneurially equipped students is, is where we're heading. Um, I think also the who then is therefore not just academics, but also students and alumni and bringing in alumni back onto campus, both as surrogate entrepreneurs, but also funders, also advisors, and so on. Because there's a, a rich uh, pot up there of potential entrepreneurs that are going to help us to develop these activities. And then the how, I think, is again going beyond the traditional TTOs to develop these new things called entre accelerators, entrepreneurship galleries. You can, you can see that business plan competitions and so on, to actually almost perhaps change the curricula that actually brings in a more hands-on way of, of becoming entrepreneurial. So that's not just, notice I've got plus, plus, plus all the way down there. So this is not just replacing traditional activities, this is enhancing them. So if I think about the coming decade, that I think what that suggests is that different universities have got to diff develop different support models to fit their research strength and their particular approach, rather than trying to say, well, the way forward is, is to, as we've seen in the UK, is to adopt the MIT model, uh, which may be very specific to MIT and certain universities, but may not be appropriate elsewhere. I, th I think that also means we've got to reach out to embrace these additional approaches uh, to involve informal IP beyond formal IP students and alumni. And I think also that means connecting more with university departments uh, and involving that with curricular developments as well. 
and so also this evaluation becomes important. So I think that then means we've, we've got to think about how we try to integrate these different support mechanisms into a continuum. I think there's a lot of kind of fragmented things going on. Uh, students get to a certain point or faculty get to a certain point and then the support stops without a connection to the next part of the continuum. Uh, I think, and I think that's a big challenge if we're going to, to exploit fully the, the opportunities available. So I, as an entrepreneurship professor, I have to say, talk about opportunity. So I think this is a, an opportunity, not a threat. It's a challenge. Um, but actually, uh, if we want to resolve the problem of how universities contribute to society in a, an environment where we're uh, perhaps under attack, uh, it's probably not too uh, strong a word, by government and many folks, and I think to actually resolve that, then we have to uh, adapt to what we're doing um, in, in the kind of ways I've been talking about. So I'll stop there, and uh, thank you for your attention. Dear Chairman, dear Professor Mendoza, dear audience from research public bodies and in, from industry, good morning, even if it is almost afternoon, to all of you at the Porto Palacio Conference Center to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Inesc Tech. I still remember well the Menu Future Conference in 2007 here in this room, which ended with the Porto Manifesto, an initial spark for EFRA, the European Factories of the Future Research Association. I'm pleased and honored for your invitation to give a talk on the importance of R&D and innovation for the success of companies in the tough global competition. In my presentation, I will share with my view on securing the innovation leadership. The examples are taken from Daimler, but they are, in my opinion, applicable to the entire industry. First of all, it's a little small table, so excuse that, please. Uh, first of all, I will give you a background. The innovation as a key factor is the next point. Core issues of individual mobility of tomorrow. And finally, the R&D process chain. So, next slide, uh, the key questions. During my talk, I try to answer three questions. Why is innovation leadership so vitally important for the future provision companies? What are the core themes of individual mobility of tomorrow? And what are the success factors for research and development? So, in this, you can see um, we have to start with the background of my speech, and uh, we see in the next four. Innovation is future provision and the basis for future growth. My hypothesis based on experience. Innovation is future provision and the basis for future growth. By Significantly expanding our portfolio, we create the basis for further profitable growth. Today, we have more than 40 different style body styles in our company, and this will become more in future. And we started in the 70s with three different cars. It was uh, the S-Class, the Sport Car, the SL, and the Medium Class, the E-Class. And so you see what happened in between. So, Mercedes-Benz cars, product highlights, you see on this picture, 
the next picture. These were only the highlights which we give out in 2015. So you see eight new cars, eight new models in one year. Normally in the 70s we have every two or three years one new car. Gross driven OEMs had to shift to value suppliers. So this gross is normally not, could be not done only by the OEMs, but also by suppliers. And uh, to reduce the risks, OEMs had to shift value suppliers as shown on the right part of the slide. Additionally, new, formerly non-automotive suppliers were needed and to cover the new fields relevant for new features equal the field of electronics and connectivity. In the next slide, the globalization uh, is changing the business. Uh, this fact has been also confirmed by a recent study called FAST 2025 from Oliver Weiman and VDA. According to this study, the value added on automotive industry will significantly from 1.5 in 2020 uh, 2025, and the suppliers will take over even a bigger share of the cake. This is true uh, not only in production, but also here in R&D. You see, yeah, you see here uh, an increasing also in R&D that will be done by the suppliers. We think it will be more than 20% in future and in production more than 9%, and in total more than 13%. This will differ from company to company, but I think it will be even more than the 13%. So uh, it's very important to see this for the uh, NGOs uh, here in uh, our companies. So, Next part is the major OEM task, coordination of the worldwide network of partners. And even more important task is, has already will become the result-oriented coordination of the worldwide network of partners from the scientific community, which we have represented here. The suppliers and also the other OEMs will cooperate in several non-differentiating fields like joint purchasing component standards, and even in vehicle development of basic features. Our partners from the scientific community are equal Fraunhofer throughout Germany, and uh, MIT, ETH, Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, Tonji in Shanghai, University of Tokyo, Waseda University, and Beijing Institute of Technology, and University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. So we support third level education and training of skilled workers everywhere we have production plants in the world, equal Beijing, Polytechnic, Keschkmet, and uh, in Baden-Württemberg, has R&D, has an R&D intensity of 4.8% of the gross domestic products. So that is also important because we have various university and RTOs which are specialized on automotive, machining, and information technologies. Yes, please. Is it? Yes, it's an, oh yes. Sometimes it does not work so properly. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so. So I think, no, innovation as a key factor, yes. Innovation as a key factor. So innovation as a key factor for long-term success. And uh, CEOs has uh, uh, been asked for key factors for the company success in international competition. As number came out technologically innovation, especially for the automotive industry, and number two, advanced customer service. 
As an innovation pioneer, Daimler builds on a strictly customer-oriented innovation and technology strategy, which is an integral part of the Daimler corporate, corporate strategy. So, yeah. I will give you two examples for that. Uh, you see on the left side that uh, in, I think it was 20 years ago, we invented some kind of car, which you can see here, a whole tilt body. And this looks very funny, I think, but uh, the main idea was to have a different active control body for the curves. And uh, what happened 20 years ago, uh, 20 years later, is that we first introduced to the market the ABC, that means the active body control in this car. So uh, this we call now dynamic, cur dynamic curve. And this is really good for driving with high comfort in the S-Class. The other point is uh, the HMI cam touchpad. So this was also 15 years ago. Uh, in our uh, innovation department, in our research department, we tried to use the hand on a touchpad with a camera. But normally, if you have the camera looking at the hand, you cannot see the icons below. So we uh, find a software that we could through, look through the hand and see all the icons on the pad, on the display. And this is first introduced now here in the CAM touchpad in our car, in the E-Class. So these are two examples uh, for highly innovation things. And normally, innovation takes sometimes longer than we think uh, in the past. So now, next slide. Um, Daimler is number three among all companies in the German patent filing. Statistic that next to Bosch, then Demons, and number one among the OEMs. You see that in this picture. And in the next picture, yeah. Uh, R&D is an integral part of Daimler's industry 4.0 offensive. I think you know this offensive in Germany, and I think it's called everywhere in the world a little bit different, but we call it Industry 4.0. Digitizing of all business processes is a major trend worldwide to increase the speed and efficiency of all the processes, since R&D generates digital product data for the entire value chain. It has been to be an integral part of the Daimler Industry 4.0. Okay, so the next point, um, ladies and gentlemen, what are the core issues of the individual mobility for tomorrow? So we'll see here the main factors, uh, the trends, global trends influencing the mobility of tomorrow. If we want to deal with the questions, we have to look at the global trends which influence the mobility of tomorrow. Because of my time constraints, I cannot go into every detail, just a few words. We have already covered digitalization because of the individualization trend, and we offer a broad spectrum of different body styles and interior design of our cars. The sharing economy trend which means pay per use leads to business models like car to go, that means more renting cars, which are custom made for mega cities. I will now focus on the carbon dioxide regulation, which directly correlate to the fuel consumption of the cars. 
The slide clearly shows that carbon dioxide seed targets become stricter in all relevant markets. Europe presently has the most stringent targets and plans to tighten the limits even further. This is indeed easy to enact, but becoming increasingly difficult to implement. As you know, it is about the average consumption of the entire fleet of a manufacturer. That includes all vehicles of the manufacturer which have been sold in the respective market from the micro to full-size cars. So, individual mobility remains important, but will be different. It will be clean, connected, safe, equal accident-free, and autonomous. Since the driver and his moods are the biggest risk factors, therefore our job is to reinvent the whole automobile. Um, our strategy for sustainable mobility, which is clean mobility, is based on three pillars. High-tech internal combustion engines. Second, internal combustion engines with hybridization. And third, electrical vehicles with batteries or fuel cells. The power management, the energy management, the first point, in this case, uh, tires are very important. There is no one point to say uh, to have a, if you make something at the engine and you have solved all the problems. No, that's not right. You have the whole parts you can see on the picture to pick up. Tires, direct injection, air compression, power steering, generator, fuel pump, echo start, stop, fan shutter, the aerodynamics, and last but not least, the lightweight design of the body shell and the components. In addition to the drives, the entire vehicle is critical. We call it the 3D body engineering of Mercedes-Benz which includes aerodynamic optimization, intelligent lightweight design, that means the right material at the right place. Makes no sense to make the whole body out of uh, very expensive materials because nobody will pay for that. So the right material at the right place, that we call intelligent lightweight design. And the safety structure as a whole. The results speak for themselves. The results speaks for themselves. You see here on the left side the aerodynamics, and here in terms of lightweight design, you can see competitor two is. Uh, Compared to our vehicle, 1.4, that means 120 kilo more uh, weight, and the other competitor is 75 kilograms more. So in total, this is a lot of work to do that we find out, and uh, every kilogram is uh, very important, but sometimes when I'm going into a car, and uh, I used to have five years ago 145 kilogram, it's, uh, it's senseless. <laughs> so, but that's not normal. So, in the next picture, intelligent lightweight design. Uh, yes, here the focus of the process technology. We should be highly efficient, flexible, and adaptable, and zero defects. So, so, focus on the process technology, I told you already, and uh, 
In short, uh, high added value manufacturing, a vision of develop within the many future European technology platform, uh, and I think we got a lot of things to do there. And uh, in the next slide, I can tell you something about the future generating uh, high added value that will generate the wealth. The process will be lean, clean, green, and sustainable with zero emission and zero waste. Uh, the manufacturing system is the center which refines raw materials and energy by means of people and their knowledge and intelligent machines into high quality and high added value products. A very good example is dry machining of metals by removing coolants with, we could avoid emissions, waste, potential hazards, and could save energy and money at the same time. We started this technology back in 1994 with the basic investigations followed by a various experimental and pilot production runs. In 2001, we were able to first introduce dry machining into volume production of aluminum wheel carriers. Today, 60% of our machining processes in Unterturkheim plant run on this technology. The other processes cannot be changed. So, now, we have now a small video, and I try to start the video. If it is not possible, a technician should help me. Oh, it works. So this is uh, an example for fast joining techniques. Uh, you can see, we call it ROPSCAN. It's uh, remote laser welding on the fly. That means you see here, where is it? It's, you can imagine how fast it is. I want to show the, the, the scanner at the head of the robot. And within the scanner, you have a beam, a laser beam, which can be positioned very fast on the material. And so you see here the scanner, the blue one. The blue one is a scanner, and uh, it's a 3D application. So uh, we are much more faster than conventional spot welding. And the idea is that we are much better in the uh, spots because we can design the spots. It's not only an arc, but it can be also very different. I think we can show this the next picture. Yeah, this first of all is, it's not a work only at Mercedes. It was a work between Trump, Rexroad, a corporation, ESV, is that's uh, at University of Stuttgart, MSC Software, and IDAC. And of course, Mercedes-Benz. And this was very, very yeah, uh, good cooperation, we say. And uh, we introduced this technology in the five years ago for the mass production. And as you can imagine, it's very difficult to go first with a new application into mass production. That means 1,000 cars a day. If you have no success, you will stop the whole assembly. So that's not possible. So it was really. We had not only good luck, but we had the right partners to solve all the problems we had in the, in the beginning. So that was Robscan. Uh, the next point is here. Yes, the process that is here in this picture. Uh, to reach to the next level of competitiveness from trial to error to science-based process development. So we did in Robscan a lot of things which were trial and error, but 
in future, we have to come more to science-based processes. As you might imagine, future manufacturing does become more challenging because you have to use new materials and exceeded technolog technological limits in processing. To increase the speed of innovation by reducing the experimental effort together with the error rate, it is essential to have science-based models available. We need science-based clarification of manufacturing processes as a basis for future technical intelligence. Today, we rely mostly on trial and error. You can see here uh, the ROP scan. Uh, you see that we can really make new patterns, an arc, or a line, uh, whatever, as we need in the design of the stability of a car. And uh, the most invention was that is if you take lines like this, you have a much smaller flange and you can save weight and uh, up to 16 kilogram per car. This seems to be not much, but this is, every kilogram is very important to save. So, you see here the flanges. You have here 12 millimeter or 16 millimeters, 12 millimeter, 10 millimeters, and now we are on most flanges on eight millimeters, and then we save up to 16 kilogram for a car. So, lightweight design. Um, Arena 2036 is a long-term research project at the University of Stuttgart, Professor Bauernhansel, which should demonstrate a potential of future technologies for the customer-specific automotive production. The initial products, project deals with factory without fences, safe human robot cooperation, resolution of working cycle and concentration, process modules instead of assembly lines, and concentration via mobile robots car drive autonomously to the modules, modular systems for production. So, that's, that's the next point now. Yeah. So, uh, the hybridization, there is no faster way to explain hybrid technology, then you take Formula One. As you know, perhaps this weekend we had the Formula, Eins, Formula One races in Austin, Texas, and uh, I think uh, Mercedes at the moment is the best one in hybridization. They can uh, call up their power as they want, as they like, as it is necessary. And uh, now Lewis Hamilton will be the world championship. This race was won by him. And it seems to be that Rosberg will be the second one, also Mercedes-Benz. It is really a top performance despite downsizing. Formula One came from 2.4 liter engines to 1.6 liter engines. 1.6 liter engines V6 B turbo, maximum of 15,000 RPM. Uh, this is limited not by the Technic, by uh, the engine, but it's limited by the electronics. Electronics is not fast enough to control the whole combustion system. Instead of 2.4 liters, the efficiency now with a 1.6 liter engine is 30% better than before, because we are using all power which is, comes from breaking down the system and uh, some other things, uh, thermical things. So 
it's really a great use. With the same energy, you can save 30%. So the, the point is that our S-Class, the S500 plug-in hybrid, is an eight-cylinder power, but four-cylinder fuel consumption. Locally is zero emission because of the power, electrical power. On the next slide, our strategy for sustainable mobility, electric vehicles. What's about pillar three? Electrical vehicles with batteries or fuel cells. The overview shows the challenge, which are about reducing weight to use the existing energy for driving and for operation. Uh, that's the electric drive. And to increase the available range. That means intelligent lightweight design, energy efficiency, e-drive components, energy management, and battery development. So, however, what is the big challenge for the future? I can show you in the next slide. As you know, perhaps, uh, the energy storage, the energy storage is at the moment the biggest problem. It's very heavy and not so much storage in. The highest density of energy is at the moment in gasoline. So uh, it has to be changed. So we think that up to 2025, we will have a factor 2.5 from here to here. That means uh, less than 200 euros, 200 euros for the costs, and here for the weight, um, it's Energiedichte, it's 280. That means we will have a factor of 2.5 in terms of cost and in terms of energy density. This is not the end of the road. It has to be better, even in 2025, but it's one first step in a better world. So, however, furthermore, uh, we have various changes for successful market penetration of e-mobility still remain. Furthermore, there are additional challenges for the market penetration of electromobility like charging, infrastructure, and times. And uh, last but not least, customer acceptance. So this will be changed, this has to be changed, and we see the electability, practical, and emotions. Nevertheless, all OEMs have electrical vehicles in their portfolios. And uh, uh, our full electric series vehicles are the smart electric type, the B-Class, and the Densa, which is offered uh, only in China and has been developed in cooperation with BYD. BYD uh, is for Build Your Dreams. It's a Chinese company. And the B-Class fuel cell has been produced in small series. The car demonstrated already. It's suitably for everyday use in a various pilot product in different climate zones. And this you can see here. So we had made from Germany, made a trip around the world but uh, you see here, uh, and back to Germany, my personal Siberia tour was more here, <laughs> in this direction. It was more cold and more practically, but it was very hard. So it's a, a fuel cell uh, demonstration, and I think this can be also the future energy for uh, moving in a car. So next point. Um, the global fuel cell partnership is established to reduce the cost. We have joint forces with Ford, Nissan, 
in order to raise synergies, we develop a single fuel cell system together in the size of a usual internal combustion engine so that we can exchange when fuel cell is ready, exchange the internal combustion system to a fuel cell system. We expected shared R&D cost, economies of scale, and a strong signal to suppliers and infrastructure providers that we are serious willing to bring the system on the market. We also have established a consortium to build the necessary hydrogen infrastructure, at least in Germany. Uh, we have at the moment only 12 uh, gas stations, and that's not enough uh, for suitable uh, acceptance of the customers. Mercedes-Benz Intelligent Drive uh, combines accident-free driving with autonomous driving by fusion and evaluation of different sensor signals from a stereo camera, long and short-range radar, and ultrasonic sensors to support the drivers in difficult traffic situations. So, at the moment, we think in a leading safety technology, not only in passenger cars, but also in the truck division. Mercedes-Benz has a long-standing history in safety innovations that characterize our brand. Of course, also here we cooperate with outstanding partners around the world. So, the next point is the S500. So I think I have to start the movie. Yeah. Um, this is uh, traveling in an S class. The driver is sitting behind the steering, but he does nothing. The start is in Mannheim. Mannheim is a 200,000 inhabitants town and stops in, in uh, Pforzheim, 100,000 inhabitants. And the driver is doing nothing. You see, even if there is crossing someone, uh, you have cars coming in front, the car reacts automatically. And uh, it's very easy to solve these problems for big highways but uh, going in town, it's not so easy. And here you can see what the system is calculating to have no problems or accidents uh, with the car. Uh, you can have, you can buy this also in the S-Class, but at the moment, because of security, because of law, uh, we say every 30 minutes, please take the steering in your hand. Uh, <laughs> but you see, it is also possible to do it fully automatically. I think this will not be so far in future. I think personally, first of all, we will have the big trucks. Because if you have an accident with a big truck and a small car, even if it is S-Class, you are really the loser in this accident. So if the accident-free truck driving would be by law in the future, I think this would be an ex uh, really an asset. So securing the innovation leadership, the process chain R&D. So innovation manager, we have some kind of innovation system at Daimler. Our innovation management could be described as a funnel model, beginning very broad with trends research, uh, strategic evaluation, and technology moni monitoring. In the following research and advanced engineering phase, we have to demonstrate for selected topics that the concept works for automotive uh, application and the next step is the application development with the followed, followed by the serious development for a specific model. 
It's very easy to show that it works with 100 cars, but to make 1,000 or 2,000, 2,000 a day, that's a quite different world. So in our next slide, uh, represented with R&D subsidiaries, in all relevant markets and innovation centers, we have uh, cooperation with E-Drive components in Redford, Vancouver with the fuel cells, Sunnyvale with design and telematics. Uh, that's since uh, 20 years. MB Tech Centers in USA, LA, and Ann Arbor, testing missions since 50 years, California Air Resources Board, Bricksworth, Brackley, Formula One in UK, except Ferrari and Sauber, Switzerland, Bangalore, Pune, India, IT, CAD CAM, uh, engineering and simulation, uh, IT Center of India, Yokohama Telematics, Beijing, Design Drive Assistance System Testing, Powertrain, Local Adaptions, Homologation, Shenzhen Electrical Vehicles Corporation with BYD and Denza brand exclusively for China. So you see this is a broad thing to make, but what is the, the result? First, the summary. Better is the enemy of the good. We need innovation for products, processes, and business models for the future success of our company, or, or the other companies too, in a globalized world. The receipt for success and economic systems is networking with highly competent partners along the whole value chain. Intensified networking is also applies to the R&D process change, and we need even more competence centers worldwide. Not only a big competence center in the southern part of Germany and or northern part of Italy, and here, for instance, in Portugal, we need it all over the world. So right here, we need long-term stable innovation partnerships with outstanding university and RTOs, such as INESC Tech. You might also know that anyone who rests on his laurels will slowly but surely disappear. And sometimes I will say, only dead fish go with the flow. And it is inspired people that makes a difference, just as you. Let us swim against the teed. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. I'd like to thank the speakers because although we had to stop uh, this session for quite a while, we were able to keep it almost within time. Uh, I can tell you that the news that we got from the uh, hospital that Eberhard Bessie seems to be okay now, everything is under control. So we think we can be easier. And so uh, we are very happy with news. And now we will go and have lunch together. It's in, the, in, the, the, it's in the hotel downstairs. We can go inside or outside, but I, I think that we have people outside that will guide you to the restaurant. Thank you very much for keeping with us, and we'll meet downstairs. <laughs>